Are you interested in investing in industrial commercial real estate? Watch this video to find out the key team members you need before you do your first investment. But before we get started, I want to thank our sponsor, who is the law office of Ronald Rohde. You know, these videos are great. I, I hope people find them useful and they wouldn't be possible without the equipment and the lighting and the, the software. My law office is available for you guys. We want to help people invest in industrial commercial real estate. So hit the link below, um, check out my new ebook. Uh, it's on Amazon. Thanks for tuning in. Smash that like button. All right, guys, this video is going to break down all of the different team members that you need to execute your first industrial commercial real estate deal. Now, evaluating these types of triple net properties is a little bit different than your normal residential or multifamily property. So it's important to understand who are the key players and when to build relationships and the right questions to ask them. So let's jump right into it. The general list is going to be a broker, um, and we're going to break those down between leasing versus sales of the property, and those aren't always the same person. You're going to have your lender. That's going to be a key partner in terms of the capital stack. You have your attorney, somebody like me that's going to help you review the contracts, ensure that the LOI matches the PSA. We could review due diligence, leases, et cetera, a CPA. Uh, that's you know your accountant, bookkeeper, all of that in accounting. Uh, it's really important to understand the tax ramifications. Property inspection. That is a specific person that provides maybe a PCR, a property condition report. Um, you're going to need engineers who can look at the building and give you an analysis based on the structure. And a residential inspector is not going to cut it when you're looking at commercial construction. Finally, you may want a contractor. This is going to be a general contractor. If you have a value add plan and you want just kind of a ballpark of estimates, you may want to walk this property with your general contractor. Finally, property manager. If you have a third party property manager or you're intending to switch the management over, it's important to have them walk the property and get a sense of the age of the building, the types of tenants, and some of the issues and work involved with managing a property that you may purchase. All right. So let's go in. Your broker is going to be a first stopping point for a lot of these different deals. And I say that because once you've identified your market, you've identified your property type, you're probably going to want help identifying the properties that uh, suit your needs. And working with a local broker can really get you access to different off-market deals. They can give you advice on pricing um, and as well as helping you connect you to other professionals in the area that they've worked with, as well as just uh, providing kind of oversight throughout the acquisition process. So uh, I talked to her a little bit about the distinction between leasing and sales. So initially, you're going to want to make contact with a sales associate or an agent, you know, depending on where you are, they may be called agents, they may be salespersons, or you may work with the actual broker. Um, I use the terms kind of interchangeably, and I've, I've had other people in videos contact and, and, and call me out and say in the comments, you know, that's not a broker, but for, for purposes of my purposes, they're all interchangeable. I say the broker, and that is the real estate brokerage that represents your interests and gets a commission from the sale of a property. So once we have that out of the way, your broker, okay? The person that is responsible for sourcing these off-market or these investment deals, they're going to have a geographic specialty or they're going to have an asset type specialty, depending on the size of their team and the length of their experience. There are different brokers that can sell throughout the whole state of Texas um, just based on their experience, and they are agnostic on property types. So they might sell flex, they might sell outdoor storage, they might have some tilt wall whatever um, comes up in the state, that's where their connections are. And on the flip side, you may have people that really specialize in a specialty niche like refrigerated storage. And throughout the state, people know that this refrigerated guy, he can get you the deals 
um, throughout the state and, and maybe even bleeding over into say like Oklahoma or smaller markets where they don't really have some of those dedicated brokers that know the nuances of that particular market. So uh, interview a few, talk to different brokers. And I think my one piece of advice is really to make sure that you're a good fit for that broker. And what I mean is whatever your experience level, whatever your purchase price or the, the strength of your offers Make sure that that's a broker who's hungry for your business. And you may need to move down the totem pole a little bit to find that broker that's going to work with you directly who wants your deals. And I can't stress that enough, but having somebody who appreciates you and values the size of your deal and, and look, looks forward to that commission check, that's what I think is going to produce a good relationship. Yes, you want expertise. Yes, you want some of that oversight from an, an experienced broker who has done this before. But in terms of your actual personal relationship, find somebody who is really hungry for those deals, who maybe has a little bit of experience, um, but can really work with you and grow with you. So just making sure people are right sized. You don't want to be too big than your broker and you don't want to be too small either. So then finally, you know, let's talk about leasing. If you acquire a property, you should also have some contingency plans if there is a vacancy in your property. So whether you have a multi-tenant building and there is some existing vacancy, you can have the property manager also source some tenants, but you may also want to put on a specific broker for finding new tenants for the entire building. And that's kind of a, a financial trade-off that you have to make with your property manager. But it's another one of those decision points that is the broker who sourced my deal, the same broker that has the connections to want to do leasing, understanding that leasing tends to produce smaller commission checks, but it's more steady. So if you build a relationship with leasing, then you can get steady landlord commission checks as leases are signed throughout the life cycle and the investment hits, those will be less frequent, but maybe every couple of years. So just so you understand, those are two different hats. Um, they can be the same person, but not necessarily. So let's go to the next one. This is your lender. You know, I'm assuming that most people who are watching this video are not paying cash. Uh, so they will have some debt. Uh, I'll assume, you know, kind of a range people can have as low as maybe 40% leverage, which is, which is super conservative all the way up to the seventies, 75, you know, maybe we're starting to see some 80% LTVs. I, I just read an article on some of these lenders who are aggressive for this, um, really credit quality product. They're pushing LTVs to 80%, um, which is um, a sign of the times, but if they are anywhere in that capital stack between 50 to 60, 70%, they're a big part of the purchase price. And so therefore in the capital stack, they're an important partner. If you had a single investor, an equity investor who's putting 50% down, you would certainly hold them with kid gloves. You would do a lot of due diligence. And my piece of advice is again, work with the lender who appreciates you uh, and wants your business. I would recommend going with the smallest lender in terms of assets under management, revenue, whatever your metric, but the smallest lender that could do your size of deal. And so again, just by way of example, if you have a $25 million purchase and, and you know, you're getting a loan of 18 million, you probably can't go with a credit union. You can't go with a small, super small regional bank. You're going to exceed some of their individual borrower lending limits just because they only have 300 million to loan out. They can't give 18 million on a, on a single borrower that they maybe don't have a relationship with. So go with the smallest bank, which may be now a regional bank or a, you know, a statewide bank that can do an $18 million loan for a first time borrower. But choose the smallest loan. Don't automatically jump to Chase. Don't go to Wells Fargo and definitely don't go to Truist if that's your first interaction with them. Because if you're not doing a $100 million loan with repeat business, you're just not going to be a priority for them. And so that's you know really my experience from working with clients that have run the gamut from big banks to small banks. The smaller banks you go, they're more responsive and the money is all fungible uh, at the end of the day. So Unless the technology platform is really lacking and maybe you want the apps, maybe you need the ACH, but again, choose the minimum level of competency that you need to get the deal done. And if that's technology, that's okay. But 
I would look to the smallest level. So that's it for lender attorney. You know, I, I think that what we do is, is super important. I think it's critical to understanding that purchase and sale process. However, I do know that we're a tool and we are a tool that can be used in finite amounts because there is a quantity of lawyer that you as a consumer can choose to buy. And I think that it's really important for you to understand what the lawyer does and what we don't do. You know, there's a lot of situations where my clients don't have brokers because they feel very confident on their own underwriting and their pricing model of the of the purchase property. And so they don't have a broker. And then they're going to ask me to kind of run point over the rest of the deal in terms of coordination or, or getting these documents. And that's okay. But as long as you communicate it up front and there's clear expectations, as well as you know the fee structure, if you can do a la carte, that's great. But going into a deal with a lawyer and just saying, review this contract, well, you know, that's that's very vague instructions. And I think that really to build your repertoire or to build your toolbox as an investor is to understand how all of these tools, you know, I've got what are your one, two, three, I've got seven different partners that make up your team. And you as an investor have to just decide how much of each tool do we want to use? What is the good cost versus benefit for every every tool here, what for every vendor, you know, these are professional vendors or contractors or tradespeople, whatever. And you have to know how much to use, or you can defer to the, the vendor and say, Hey, I trust you. You tell me what's, what's the best outcome in my situation. So that's for lawyer, you know, there's going to be some of those distinctions, securities. If you're doing say like a reg D raise, um, you have your PSA review, you have title survey, that's kind of due diligence. You may also have a lawyer for your financing, uh, depending on, on how complex your financing is, CMBS or some public markets. Um, you may have a separate securities slash financing attorney. You may have your corporate attorney that's doing all of your corporate docs as separate from your real estate attorney who reviews your PSA and due diligence and you know can really dig into the leases. You may also have a zoning attorney. You have a land use attorney that if you want to buy this property and change the, the use for it, you're going to need a whole separate tool. So, you know, just talking now, I've, I've come across four or five different types of attorneys that all may be involved on a single transaction. So it's up to you to decide, do you want the jack of all trades that can cover most of this? Do you not need certain pieces? What are the costs? And again, understanding what type of lawyer you need and how much is really going to put you at an advantage when you're talking to the lawyer, because you're going to come across more credible and with a clearer communication of your needs. So let's talk about the accountant. You know, uh, just broadly, I'm going to lump all of these kind of together because I think of them as usually a one-stop shop. You know, you have your bookkeeper, um, which may be related to property management, but it's it's only going to feed into your asset level management. Um, you're also going to need an accountant, you know, a CPA that's going to file your actual tax returns. And you may also have a tax structuring accountant who, again, will just put together kind of high level structures of what do we create? What are the entities? What are the contracts? What are the management agreements? And they may not be involved after that initial structuring conversation. But again, for the CPA, for the bookkeeping, it's important to have a handle on what do you want this accountant to do uh, and making sure that you hire the right sized accountant for your project and for your needs. Uh, next, we have your property inspector. So this is something that there are a lot of companies out there. There's large national vendors that do these PCRs. They're very standardized reports. So, you know, I would really recommend that you get a, a copy of a sample, um, maybe just thumb through it. It's uh, light reading, you know, they're usually about 60 pages long, but they really go into depth on the, the construction of the building, the size, the different um, systems inside. If there are sprinklers, you know, full sprinkling is, is a big issue. Um, a lot of different tenants may need that. And so it can be a value. You want to make sure they're operating. Maybe there's crane systems. There could be hydraulics. If there's rail service, you have doors, all sorts of mechanical systems in an industrial building. And you need a good property inspector to tell you what's working, what's not. Is it important? How much does it cost? Lots to, to unpack there. 
Um, similar to that, you have a general contractor and they are completely different. You know, I don't think you should rely on a general contractor to look at some of these mechanical systems. The property inspector is just there to give you an assessment. They're like a snapshot that says, this is what the building is. These are all my observations of the systems. These are the names, the makes, the models, all that stuff. And then your general contractor, he's going to be somebody that's going to implement a plan to, to renovate a building. You know, if we're talking about installing doors, dock high, uh, maybe some bigger roll-ups or man doors or, um, you know, paint and, and restriping the parking lot. You know, that's your general contractor's job to coordinate all those trades, including maybe new AC units and, and including a build out of some office space. But your general contractor may want to walk the property with you so you can start building a budget for your vision of, of what you may need to spend on this particular asset. Finally, I have property manager. You know, um, I think a lot of people do self-manage these triple net properties. You do need a little bit of staff, but I would say for the most part, triple net, um, you know, you can do online ACH payments. Other than the two to three month transition period, there's a lot of work to be done on the transition, but thereafter, things are kind of on autopilot, you know, assuming nothing's going wrong with the building, they're paying rent on time, you're paying your mortgage on time. There's not a whole lot of management needs. And I think that's a nice feature of triple net industrial is that it really can get to a hands off kind of autopilot place uh, compared to something like multifamily, which constantly has turnover and things age a lot faster. And the needs of those tenants are really just, just much higher than most industrial users. So think about a property manager, what they cost, what the benefit is. Um, perhaps you want to do it yourself in the beginning just to start. And then once you know how to do the process, you could bring it in house after you've had a year or two paying somebody else. And so you know, that's, that's really a brief overview. If I've forgotten about anybody, if you're a part, a part of the commercial real estate process, drop a comment down below. I, I know I couldn't cover everything, um, but these are some of the most critical partners to include on your first industrial real estate deal, but that's it from me. So thanks for watching. Smash the like button, um, subscribe, and we'll see you next time.